you were just starting to answer the question when you were taken away. Yes. So the question was about the how we share good practice and what works. And I think there is a problem within the NHS um, about how we identify whether something is properly evaluated and then rolled out. Um, and there are two aspects to this. There are a lot of pilots are conducted um, and do not have a built-in evaluation. Um, and that um, is problematic for a number of reasons because... So, for instance, there are two pilots we've been involved with in emergency medicine. One was the NHS 111st. This was an idea that people who were deemed to be low acuity attendants at a hospital would be encouraged to phone NHS 111 and go away and seek alternative and be directed to alternative care. We entered into this in good faith, as a, um, but with some scepticism, because we work in a complex system and it's often we don't know about unintended consequences. We've never seen results from that pilot. We don't know whether it works. We don't know whether it doesn't work. We suspect because it, we haven't seen any evaluations, it probably didn't work, but we don't know. Mm. Likewise, we took part in a pilot understanding a series of new performance metrics, the clinical review of standards. 14 hospitals took part in a national pilot. They were exempt from reporting information into NHS performance figures during this, the conduction of the pilot. We see those 14 hospitals are now exempt from all levels of reporting. Continued. No one said whether the pilot has started, has stopped. It's just when those hospitals are in a performance vacuum. Um, <coughs> we haven't seen any information around whether this has been helpful or harmful. So when pilots like that are done, they um, and we don't see the results of taking part of it, um, we're uncertain as to whether they take effect. We go and create our own data, and we do our own evaluations as a specialty, but that's inordinately time-consuming, and it should be part of routine business. The NHS has bits, NHS England has bits of its organisation that are devoted to doing this. So Julie will say as a university professor, trying to get stuff implemented, uh, research through a university is inordinately time consuming and, and that's right and proper. The NHS in England has a something called the strategy unit based in the West Midlands. It's like, it has access to all sorts of data. It can do evaluations quickly, but we don't feel it's being used nearly to its full potential. And those are sort of formal pilots that are They'll organized evaluations. They may, they may provide either a, a evidence review or they may say, you've done this, we'll tell you whether it worked, yes or not. Right. I wonder, Judith, I mean, you're obviously going to do, with your university hat on, some of the research and evaluation of, of um, different ways of working in terms of breaking the mould of what, 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 how, how things have always been done. So how do you see in a, in a bringing innovation, rolling out innovation as good practice? So as, as Adrian said, there's, there's different ways of doing it. Um, so from a university perspective, largely we would be involved in um, research as opposed to a pilot. And I think, I think some of this is around what do we mean by a pilot? Mm -hmm and a feasibility study, yes. because yeah. in the ambulance service that, I, I, that I'm in, um, they do a lot of pilots, but they may not have an evaluation built into it, and there will be, there will be governance wrapped around it, they will monitor it, and there's some very good things that have happened because of it. Is that actually a pilot? Are we actually evaluating the impact on patient care? I think those are the sorts of things that, that we need to get better at within the ambulance service. The ambulance service, I have to say, are phenomenal um, at, at collecting data. There is such a, a vast amount of data out there, whether you're looking for time targets or, or out, outcomes within the ambulance service. Um, we do have issues linking that across and that is some of the, 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 the sort of stumbling blocks to seeing what, what we're doing in one area, whether it, it makes an impact in another. Um, it, I think the time factor to do research is, is one of the challenges because it can, as we know, you know the, there are papers published around, it can take seven years from coming up with the idea to getting funding to doing it and then getting that out into, into practice. And I don't think the NHS is very good at that. I mean, one of the things that comes to mind, which was set up 
by um, um, by Health Education England um, was looking at something called the rotating paramedic. So this was having one employer, um, which was the ambulance service in this particular pilot. We had four sites, and the, the paramedics were rotated around different areas into GPs, mm -hmm. practices, and into um, control. They repeated that pilot then probably the year after and again and and still although the evidence was quite strong that it made a lot of difference to um, retention of staff in the ambulance service because one of the worries is that people are leaving the ambulance service so what we're ending up with is, is a fairly um, inexperienced workforce that is just doing the frontline work if you if you use that term um, so it, it Pilots on their own, without then having the biggest block for, for getting that in, in, I believe, to be honest, was who was going to pay for it. Mm. So there were issues around commissioning that, the rotating paramedic. So that hence why we've got, um, you know, probably part-time contracts with people working in the ambulance service or people working in, in, in uh, primary mm. care. But it is difficult. And I think it's about having a centralised place where everybody knows, but that's only as good as people looking at that. And I did, we do have duplication, but I don't believe that that's, um, you know, just unique. Adrian? Yeah, I was just going to comment that, um, you know, we're desperate to know stuff doesn't work. Um, we all have good ideas, yeah. um, but actually being told that stuff doesn't work is actually really valuable for us because then we yeah. move on and not waste effort. And, mm. and that commitment to evaluation and subsequent application, we would welcome. Yeah, thank you. Good, thank you. Can I ask Baroness Pete Keithley? Yes, actually my, my question is about training, but it relates very much to what you were saying about rotating par paramedics. Um, do the staff who respond to health emergencies from wherever have access to the right kind of training and the opportunity to develop skills, which is another way of, of, of tackling retention, as we know? And it, perhaps you could couple that with saying, are there more opportunities for integrated training, more shared training across the services? Um, perhaps you'd like to start, Julie. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 that's a huge question, isn't it? So, but by emergencies, responding to emergencies, are you talking about our acute patients or all of our patients? Well, I think we're looking at, at the whole of the uh, of, of the the way the emergency services uh, work. So in terms of, um, if, if we're looking at the, the whole picture, we're actually talking about, um, you know, having to educate and skill up our workforce to manage birth to death from high acuity to low acuity, including mental health, social care. And I think it's, if you ask any paramedic, it's obviously, you know, or anyone in the ambulance service or outside of the ambulance service, um, it's... Continual professional development is really hard. It's hard to find time to do it because you are working at capacity. Um, it's hard to find clinical supervisors or mentors because so growingly there are less of those. And I'm going to mention the ambulance service for that. Pre-registration, we're trying to get students to being potentially the lead clinician on scene at the point of registration in the three years. To cover all of that, I think we have to say that it's taken us a long time. It's taken us probably 12 years to actually get to the point of recognising it needs to be a degree entry um, profession. For people who are already registered, uh, it's a really difficult one and it changes across the, across the trusts. Some, some trusts might, might allow two days a year for upskilling, some maybe four, and during COVID virtually everybody had none because the, de the demand, whether the numbers had gone up, but the demand out there with staff sickness, um, just that's the first thing that goes. Mm. Um, absolutely, totally for interprofessional working, and I think there's a lot of areas where we all could learn from each of our professions but it needs to be targeted um, if you're talking about working with the other emergency services i think that's probably more limited to maybe specific things around sharing resources on um, maybe having simulation for 
uh, with the fire service or the police on mental health or um, fires or traumas and things like that. But I, I think we'd have to be careful about diluting if you're talking about sharing a, a degree program with other emergency services, there may be some commonalities, but we need to make sure that we are actually equipping um, the registrants with the confidence and competence for day one. And they need clinical supervision and mentorship, and we have a newly qualified paramedic scheme, but it, it needs work. Thank you very I'm much, sure it's the same. Adrian. Um, so the it's disproportionate across the professions. So we have a very good training program for our, our doctors. Um, I'm, you know, I'm in charge of the training program for emergency medicine in this country, and I would, I think it's one of the best trainings that I've seen in the world. It's a really good training program. During the pandemic and over the last couple of years, the, uh, the time given to training has been nibbled at, and we are, it is a red flag for me when I hear that training gets cancelled. Um, we have a rigorous program for training nurses and paramedics who want to train as what are called advanced care practitioners, and we've embraced that, and it's the right thing to do, but it's a rigorous, time-consuming credentialing process. That's good. I feel very strongly that our nursing staff who work in emergency departments are working in a very, I mean, emergency medicine is very much a team game, and their opportunities for professional development are considerably more limited. And when t matters get tight, and when rotors get tight, their training gets cancelled. And I think that is, it's an own goal in terms of managing mm -hmm. the staff because it um, contributes to burnout and it makes life much harder for them. Yeah. So very much false economy, but as you rightly say, it's always the first thing that goes when there's a crisis. Training in teams is a lovely idea, but it's a really time-consuming, difficult thing to set up. I'll leave it there, Hilary, but it's a rather depressing answer. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Jill. Uh, and I know you've got to go yeah. to be on the uh, wall sack fairly soon. Um, Gary, Lord Porter. Thank you. Um, do the remits, the priorities, and the approaches of, of emergency service um, accurately reflect the types of experience and demand that emergency service workers will be picking up on the ground. So there's a kind of the, the culture of how the organisations work through and the, the reality of what the, the sh people at the sharp end are experiencing. Does that kind of the whole comfort blanket of the organisation around them work in a way that says... Uh, so from my perspective, um, the, certainly one of the areas we are struggling with, and I think in the previous session you heard about, is lack of alternative access um, so that a lot of people do come to an emergency department as the, the, because it's the only place they can access services. Um, we have a number of patient groups. It is absolutely right and proper that people require who, is, who are seriously ill or injured come to emergency departments. There is a big group, and now probably our dominant patient group of what we call the majors, ambulant patients. These are people who walk in, but they're not trivial cases. They may not be quite so time critical. They may be somebody who presents, say, with a bit of chest pain that may or may not be a heart attack, and not until they haven't been properly looked at and evaluated, we won't know. So that majors, ambulant group is taking up an inordinate amount of effort. I'm not sure those patients completely always need the services of services of an emergency department, um, and um, but this is around other ac access to alternative care, and that's often quite poor. In, in particular, mental health. There are a particular group who really struggle with access to mental health, and it seems to be the only way that a lot of people can access mental health care is by going through an emergency and a crisis. And I think we can probably do better as a country about than that. Well, just a few bones on that particular area. Um, given that Theresa May stuck two billion quid in to deal with a lot of stuff that seemed to have got siphoned off into other priorities inside the system. Largely paying down debt by trusts as opposed to going at the front line patient care. But we can't hear you at this end. Well, that's probably just as well. I was, I, was, <laughs> <laughs> I was complaining about people who I might need to come and fix me when I break something. So, I, I, okay. And that's the trouble with being critical of anything on this, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, ten percent of the demand we've been told is GPs not seeing patients. So that's ten percent of the call-out load that 
paramedics are we dealing with? We've got another 15 to 20% that's gone through on mental health call-outs where if you'd sent two mental health nurses, they probably would have done a better job for the patient and would have been a cheaper solution for the country. I think that's one of the issues, though, isn't it? When we say, you know, 10%, have not been seen and that's why we're getting them. Was the GP the right person in the, or the right facility in the first place? Are there other healthcare professions, in, particularly in the allied health professions and, and nursing, um, who could be undertaking those roles and developing those areas? So it's certainly in, in, in my profession, the advanced scope of practice clinicians who are moving, and Adrian referred to the ACPs, which are in hospitals, um, but are moving into more primary care, have advanced education, and that's exactly the sort of thing that they're doing, and they're taking patient caseloads and, and developing. But, but that, that takes time, and it takes more education and development, so these are largely master's level and beyond. Um, so I think the question is, is, is our system most appropriate now and is there are there other ways that we can supplement what was classically um, the only way that people would go but that requires a lot of public education as well as to how to use yeah. the services it's a straightforward thing at the moment isn't it? Yeah. The doctors can't get a doctor to go to the hospital yeah and, and if we did come up or you clever people come up with something that was a better solution you'd have to spend the next 50 years educating people that that was the route through mm. sorry i'm rambling again you, thinking about that further, but there really needs to be other places where people can go outside of the a &E department. I mean, I was an a &E nurse, but it was a long time ago before either of you were born, probably. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, obviously, even then, way back in the 80s, you know, we were seeing people in a &E departments that didn't need to be there. But there was often nowhere else can go. Do you think we don't utilise places like pharmacies enough um, where pharmacists themselves, you know, when you're standing in line waiting to get your whatever it is, you hear them give a lot of care to various people who come up with um, problems. But could we not have those as hubs where perhaps you have practice nurses or uh, mental health nurses or even a clinician or something who could take some of that work away from a &E departments? So this is a question that comes around um, not infrequently. Um, in a way, we could do all of those things, but it wouldn't make any difference to the problems we're seeing with ambulance handover load, delays, yeah. because our problem is all around actually the patients who needed to be admitted to hospital. Yeah. Um, and. You know, I, I see lots of plans to try and, and prepare emergency departments, and I'm very sceptical of anything which is based around demand management. Um, I think trying to sort out, you know, people who turn up um, with low acuity problems can usually be turned around fairly quickly and fairly efficiently. They don't need hospital admission. They probably don't need the investigations that we do to them. They may get a bit over-investigated. But that's not the big problem that we're suffering with at the moment, and that's not what's causing the problems for the paramedics waiting outside and the long, awful long waits we've got in our emergency department and the long stays and the consequences that has got on mortality and health. So we could, but it wouldn't be the answer. Wouldn't it? The only thing I might add to that, though, is, and I totally agree with everything Adrian said there, about it's not going to impact on the, the delays, um, but the other part of our calls, which are hear and treat and see and treat, it is possible that that would reduce the load there. I can't say it would. Um, there are several universities that are building into the pharmacy programme patient assessment modules. Um, and actually, there's the, you know, the students are quite, quite resistant to that because they didn't actually... I, I teach on, or taught on one a few years ago, and um, they said they didn't come into pharmacy to do that sort of role. Um, but So it might impact on some of our workload, but I, it without a doubt, wouldn't impact on yours. No. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That is interesting. Um, it would mean that the A&E itself wouldn't be as crowded and distressing, wouldn't it? So yes, you might have a, a few less people in your emergency department 
um, and in your waiting room. But the problem you would have, and the problem which drives all the problems we're seeing with, with ambulance handovers, is the people in trolleys. Now, you don't see that when you go into an yeah. emergency department because the trolleys are round around the corner um, in cubicles. Um, and it's, it, there is, I feel quite strongly that this is an invisible group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's about patient flow, which we've been saying for some time. Um, thank you. Any other follow-ups on that? If not, I come to you, Lord Bishard. Yes, I, I've been asked to ask the impossible question, but I'll ask it anyway, which is what, what one intervention really would make a difference. So mm -hmm. while you're thinking about that, and I suspect you've probably already thought about it, I'd, I'd like to add a, a, a question, a genuine question. I mean, we're a select committee. We identified this as an issue which we thought was important as a public service and which was causing a lot of distress to a lot of people. So we work on the basis that we ask a lot of questions uh, and come to some conclusions. What we're finding, I think, is we're asking questions of people who are asking questions. And I'm kind of slightly perplexed that no one is coming here and saying to us, there is a vision which I have which is going to resolve this. Um, and OK, it may have slight differences around the country, regional issues and that sort of thing. But we are talking to a lot of people who are asking the same questions that we're talking about. And it seems to be a circular process. I mean, OK, so what is the one intervention that would make a difference? And Dr. Borg, as I'll start with you, have you got your vision and would you share it with us? <laughs> Yes, so I want an emergency system which is fit for purpose, so by which somebody with a severe illness or injury can be uh, responded to quickly by an ambulance, brings them to an emergency department where they're treated by quickly by a skilled clinician who identifies their need for ongoing care. And if we start by focusing on that higher acuity pathway with what... That is the, the vision that we need. And because of all the, the problems, that particular part of the pathway is broken at the moment. My vision, the first ask to try and get there, is a first meaningful, trustworthy metrics. And that means actually honest 12-hour data so we actually understand what we're dealing with. And we've got system oversight and risk sharing right across the system. Reform the difficult interface between acute hospitals and social care that, so that we don't congest our hospitals with people who can be got out. And then long term, we need to be actually looking actually at the model of beds that we have in our hospitals to try and support flow. We're running our hospitals far too hot, far too tight, and that's having all the knock-on effects. On that last point, mm. what do we have in 1986? 300,000 acute beds, we've now got 144,000. Do you think that's at the heart of the, some of the problems we're experiencing? Yes. So, um, it, particularly since at least 10,000 of those beds are occupied by people who, are, who, do, who can be transferred to another level of care. Yeah. And we're harming those people by keeping them in hospital. Yeah. But you are also saying, I don't know if it was in your mouth, but you're also saying when you talk about the data, you're actually saying in a, by, by highlighting that, you're saying we're actually in denial and we're actually hiding the, the true extent of the problem. And if, we, if you ever hide the true extent of the problem, you never get to a solution. So I think the 12-hour DTA metric is a fundamentally dishonest way of reporting data and is hiding um, and doing our patients a disservice and minimising a yeah. very serious problem. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, Julia, sorry. Can, can we ask Julia first? Yeah, yeah of course. I, I, well, I... Absolutely agree with Adrian. I mean, ideally, that's what you want for your emergency service. You, you don't want people having the delays, having the stress. You don't want staff being stressed because they can't deliver an appropriate um, level of care as they see it. Um, I think the, the biggest risk at the moment is the handover delays because that has a knock-on effect to all of our other areas. But for the ambulance service, there still needs to be a recognition that there's so much more going on to prevent people going to an inappropriate destination, for lack of a better word. And so we, you know, and we need to make sure that that's being done safely <coughs> and that we're capitalising on the experience um, that we do have within the service, uh, fundamentally from paramedics, but also from other healthcare professionals. So it, it's, it needs to be an integrated approach. 
and then utilising, as we said before, for, for the other part, not the emergency department access, utilising other healthcare professionals, other healthcare pathways. And I think it is improving. It, it's not improving across the board. You're hearing areas where it's improving, where we've got access to other healthcare routes that are, are more beneficial to the patients than the ED. Um, so it, it, it's, yeah. It's a complex picture, of course, but as far as the handover delays, that has to be about flow through. Okay. Uh, just, I think these are two narrow questions. It may be a longer answer, but I think it's a narrow question, which is what's become clear in talking to various witnesses. Obviously, we, I speak for myself as a layperson. You don't understand the complexity of whatever the data shows and what it may be counting, always for good reasons, I think, but sometimes can be at least inaccurate. So what would you suggest is the best source of data with some analysis that says broadly this is what's happened over the last 20 years? Because that point, for example, about, I think we had some data in the first meeting about the waiting times at A&Es shot through the roof in about July 21 with no clear explanation of what changed. See that something did, and I don't think it was entirely COVID. I think you've said already that. So it'd be really interesting if there's something that succinctly says in the health service in this area, this is the data, this is what is going to explain the... The complexity of it is point one. The second one is, it's a bit of a challenge, but it's, a, it's in the way that Michael was. I think it's almost possible to say that the NHS is a misnomer to say it's national. And I'm, still, I'm left wondering who's in charge, either locally or nationally, and said, look, this isn't working. Not a command and control issue, I'm telling you what to do. But broadly, we've decided this is best practice, and we are going to give it a try until somebody comes up with what's the best practice. So who's, who's responsible to say, we're going to improve the system, either nationally or locally? So the, those two questions, data and leadership. OK, so there are a number of good documents. We publish a series, what's called an acute insight series, which gives you an idea about um, the various flows of information. And I think we've submitted a number of these to, to this committee to try and support their decision making. The Nuffield Trust is also very good at producing um, um, information around um, urgent and emergency care activity, waiting times, and beds within the NHS. They have a bed tracker which is updated every month about the number of beds, and you, you correctly identified the nearly threefold loss of beds over the last 20 years. Um, in terms of who's in charge, um, it is a dynamic landscape at the moment with the establishment of the ICBs, and there's a variable level of maturity and uh, engagement from ICBs while they try to figure out what their responsibilities are. Um, it's, I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it would be a little bit more challenging than always... saying that uh, that's a committee that meets every so often. But I still come back to who's in charge, who, not, to, not to, be, you know, to be pejorative about them, but... When somebody said, look, this system, this system isn't working, we need to work at it differently. Who thinks it's their responsibility to do that? Certainly my local experience working on the, on the ground is um, my executives have very good working relationships with their local ambulance service trusts. So, so if you're thinking of the acute hospital working with their um, ambulance trust, and you know, they're the people who have, feel that they have ownership of the problem. So they said to the GPs, look, part of the issue is that you're not seeing enough people when they need to be seen. And consequently, they're self-selecting and turn up at A&E when perhaps we'd hope they go somewhere else. Could they say to a GP, we need you to think about how you address that? Uh, I don't think that, I don't know if they would do that, and I don't know the answer to that question. It seems to me without that's just one example, but across the whole system, if the GPs are an element of demand control or service delivery, if the system can't, if not direct, advise, how can because otherwise people just keep going back and say, well, the GPs are an element of it, the one one ones are another element of it, and A and E's got to think about their contribution, but. My understanding that was that there should be some delivery arm of an ICB or an ICS that is responsible for that. But I, they're still bidding in, and I don't know who, how that works in practice. Thank you. I would echo that, but also say that from the ambulance service perspective, you will find that many of the medical directors are GP. Well, not many of them, but you have a GP. So, and, and the ambulance service is... Each individual ambulance service will operate slightly differently, but CCAM, South East Coast, um, is in constant discussion with GPs 
um, around the service delivery. So it, it, it's an interesting one. I, like you said, the, the ICBs and ICSs are too new to say, but presumably that is what their target role is. And if it's not, we'd want to know why. Probably one of the problems is that we've been in dynamic transition for the last 30 years. <laughs> and you know, we, always, we always hope that the latest dynamic transition is going to take us to a happy place. And very rarely does it do that. And that may be one of the things that we want to say, but others have said it. But surely, when we're all identifying this as being a systemic problem, but all the parts of the system are within the NHS, surely someone within the NHS, not locally but nationally, has the responsibility for doing something about the problem that we're trying to examine, don't they? <laughs> Secretary of State? Well, but they, ultimately that may be so, but in terms of the executive, who would you... So I think, I think you raise an important point about where the accountability lies. Um, and I th I, and you'll have to ask NHS England and, and the DHCC where they think that lies. I suspect they will tell you that this lies with the ICBs. Um, but how that's organised, I'm not clear. And I know that you're taking evidence from... National response. Yeah, it's it? a local response to a, a national... local response, not a national response. It may be inconsistent. It, it may be locally focused, but I guess. Mm. OK. Julia, do you have a view? And I was just thinking, though, that, that there is the, 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 the work group, which I'm not going to be able to remember, remember the name, and I'm hoping you can. Julian heads it up. So NHS England, UEC, so, who is, give, I think, giving evidence later. Tonight. All right, OK. So, I mean, that is part of their, their, their remit and the discussions around accountability development. And, but I wouldn't say that they necessarily have the responsibility. You know, Lisa, which is that the structures vary around the country. We heard from, I think it was Darren earlier, he's Northwest Ambulance, but not everywhere has got a regional ambulance service. And you've got these different structure, trust structures, haven't you, within different geographies. In terms of ambulance services? Well, I just think everything, really. I mean, it, it, I mean London's a... The ambulances there. are much... I mean, they're the, they're the biggest trusts within the NHS. Yeah. Mm. Nine in, in England. Yeah. Then we heard from... Uh, sorry, I've forgotten his name, but the, the chap from uh, West Yorkshire... Len. Len. You've got you know, an arrangement with certain hospitals. Yep. But the ambulance have got different, if I understand it correctly, the ambulance service have got different structures. They've got regional one in some places. Yeah, it's, it, yeah the ambulance service is much more regionally based than... We have um, ten, I in England six. we've got the ten, uh, but we span different geographies yes. and that's the mm. problem. Yes, so, you know, not coterminous. No. no. It's only in the northeast that they're coterminous. Yeah. Right. Uh, nearly co terminus yeah, no. there because we have only got five boards, isn't it? Or yeah, something. We've, we, there's a bit goes over into Cumbria, which is not really the northeast, but is part of the uh, anyway. Um, uh, but um, that I think that there isn't the co terminosity around, and that that sometimes allows for lack of things. It, can I just very quickly? because we are about to have another vote, mm. and so we need to finish. Um, Adrian, you were talking about your vision of the high acuity getting quick access um, to emergency services and then through to appropriate treatment. Is one of the... Are, are all the people who are eventually getting into hospital, do they all need to be there? Or is it sometimes that actually... We don't have the right means of looking after them, some of them. So with these long delays that we're getting and the long delays that we're seeing with patients, there are a number of elderly patients um, who you might be able to discharge during the day, but actually you feel very uncomfortable about discharging late at night. I would feel quite uncomfortable about discharging somebody in their 80s who, ha who had uh, multiple problems who I might be able to get home at 8 o'clock in the morning you know, you get a physiotherapist to see them, walk them around the department, just actually have someone to try and evaluate whether they're safe to go home. At 10 o'clock at night, it, that would be really hard and it would, might feel quite risky. Um, so there is, when we get these very long waits, there is an effect where you end up admitting some patients a little bit longer. Increasingly, actually, those patients are just waiting in the emergency department overnight um, and that people are having a pretty grim experience while they spend a long time because there isn't a bed to admit them to. And then you start trying to do it all over again, 
um, and try and get them home first thing in the morning, by which time they're deconditioned, they may have become a bit confused, they may be a little bit delirious, they've had a pretty miserable time of it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay, anyone got any mm. other questions? Can I say thank you very mm. much mm. to mm. you? We've got a lot of thinking to do around some of these issues, but we're grateful to you for giving us that um, evidence. And if there is anything that occurs to you that you think we've missed or you want to reinforce, please let us, uh, let us know and we'll very happily take on additional information. But thank you very much and thank I formally you. end this <coughs> session. Thank you. Thank you.